creatively spend time at home would be Michael who will be coming to us live from his living room. Hello, Mike. Good morning, uh, Trix, and yes, coming uh, live from home. Of course, coming up with innovative ways of ensuring that we social distance, but also looking for new ways of working. And yeah, today I will be coming live. I am coming live from home, and uh, it's a good morning. Welcome to the show, and uh, let's see what we have in store. We'll also be looking at innovative ways that one can try and ensure that they keep busy and stay sane during this time of lockdown and not too much traveling quite important one of those things that we overlook because this is not something that happens often but obviously it's quite important to know some of the creative ways and how to spend time with the kids and Michael obviously you got that covered but then let's take a look at what's making headlines would you like to kick us off Yes, we can start off with looking at what's making headlines on the day list this morning. In case you're wondering what date it is, today is the 30th of April 2020. And we start off with a standard where the headline is where Corona millions went. And of course, this is going to be of uh, specific interest to Kenyans because we've been asking and saying that, uh, you know, government should come in and uh, bail out and ensure that we have a kitty that takes care of what we're expecting to be a very harsh and tough time mm -hmm. as Kenya. However, this is money that has come from World Bank and it gives us a breakdown of what the ministry has spent so far. Mm -hmm. And so far they have spent 1.3 billion Kenyan shilling streaks. Maybe run us through some of the figures. Yeah, the figures have been outlined on the front page of the standard this morning and we are told about a leasing of 15 ambulances that cost us 42 million. Uh, the procuring uh, enti uh, entity is the Ministry of Health and obviously the other elements whereby. And one of the more interesting ones was tea and snacks and social media last night was awash about this one because they say this was budgeted for at 10 million 125 thousand shillings and so far the tea that has been and snacks that have been used up have cost 4 million then there's communications at 70 million PPEs at 132 million plus lab equipment at uh, 301 million plus this is from for Kepsa and uh, Kemsa rather and also the PPE is well procured by Kemsa. Then we have rock, uh, rock a qu a testing kits that are at 196,000 plus. Equipment it is, is at 98 million plus. Then we have assorted PPEs and they're all pictured here just to give you an, uh, uh, you know, a look at what they mean by uh, PPEs, communication issue, uh, you know, um, equipment and then the assorted PPEs, the, you know, the full gears that look like hazmat suits are at 58,205,440. This is by UNICEF and the num amount that has been used so far uh, is 58 million um, and just the similar amount. So see if you want to see the full page table you can take a look at this story and how it's been covered on the inside and how the millions or rather there's more on this on um, page two of the standard so the how the millions were used this is um, more elaborate printing of traveler forms quarantine forms discharge forms were at 900,000 we have communications there as I've mentioned earlier on at 70,000 then we have um, the fuel and maintenance 40,000 per week estimated for 30 vehicles this is going for 14,000 or rather 14 million 400,000 shillings airtime 6 million accommodation of 30 HCW needling quarantine services for 90 days 13 million 500 thousand then we have leasing of those ambulances that is at 42,000 as I mentioned earlier on and of course we have the cash it has broken down so as to give an account accountability of sorts on how this monies were you know used and your opinions on this were quite um, loud last night uh, over social media uh, since the, the evening on what you felt the prioritization of this cash was was if it's right if it's wrong if it's you know some of them or some of the people on social media are making fun of it so it's uh, quite interesting to see how that has been uh, subdivided by the ministry officials mike yes and of course you can get yourself a copy of the standard to just catch up with that but while we're on that tricks the daily nation is also 
uh, in terms of talking about monies and agencies fight to control billions. Now, we do know that the government had promised that by now we would have mass testing that would be done. This, of course, uh, helps us to ensure that we have the right figures. We've been saying that the figures we have now, I think we had around 384 tested positive, but that might not be the correct and accurate figures that we have. But, of course, Kenyans might be wondering why is it that government has promised uh, you know to have mass testing done but this has not been done now this article on the daily nation agencies fight to control billions and the two agencies in question here is kemri and the influenza center why because there's billions that has been given by world bank but uh, the battle is the question of who should control that money who should be leading uh, this fight and of course um, your guess is as good as mine as to why they are fighting for this money if it's all for a good cause so the kenya medical research institute kebri and the national influenza center are on a tug of war on who has the right to lead the agency against covid 19. so in case you've been wondering why is it that we've not had mass testing? Well, this might be one of the clues as to why that might be happening. Absolutely. And, of course, we will be watching that to see how it unfolds in the next few days. But then, as well, and also on the, the front page of the Daily Nation, we are told about 133,657 is the number of people that have lost their jobs. And an uncertain time for families as breadwinners lose their sources of livelihoods in the face of a depressed economy. Most affected sectors have been outlined this morning on the front page page of the nation as the transport sector, aviation, hospitality and tourism, manufacturing, wholesale and trade, agriculture and the informal sector. We had um, actually agriculture taking one of the very initial hits when the flowers could not be actually transported as usual. The markets were not as open as they would be. Then we had hospitality and tourism because you cannot have tourists coming into the country. They are all isolating in their respective um, countries and homes and their Therefore, transport gets affected and aviation because of that is the main mode of transportation into the country. And then eventually you have it trickling down to the informal sector and other areas that actually are a source of livelihood for most. Yes, and uh, of course the trick question here is going to be what happens. It's going to have a ripple effect yeah. where we, we have very many people unemployed. Security is likely to take a hit because, mm. I mean, people have got to survive. We are likely to see more street families. There's just likely to be a huge, huge ripple effect. And uh, looking at those figures and the fact that uh, we don't seem to have a very accountable government, if these figures we're seeing are anything to go by, then that leaves us a little bit more concerned. Because that brings me to a story on page two. Uh, again, looking at the unemployment and the GDP that we have as a country, Treasury apparently is seeking to borrow $275 billion to help mitigate COVID-19 impact. So this again uh, is money which if spent well, if prudently and spent in the way that it, in the manner that it should be, then it should you know, cushion uh, Kenyans from a very, very harsh time that we are looking forward uh, or rather that is expected to come uh, post COVID-19 because nobody knows how that is going to be. But the government will borrow 275 billion uh, from the international financial institution to cushion Kenyans and the economy from the negative impact of COVID-19. But again, the million dollar question is once this money has been borrowed, the 275 billion, how is it going to be spent? How is that going to cushion Kenyans? Again, we've seen members of parliament uh, at some point, remember the standard had a story where we were asking where are they when we mostly expect them to be coming up with legislation that should cushion Kenyans. Absolutely. And the, who's going to be, uh, you know, paying that? It's you and me, the taxpayers. The burden still falls on us, which means this is an opportunity for, for perhaps the government to figure out that what to do in the future when there is this sort of crisis that is is promising to cripple the economy and leaving a lot of people jobless and in financial trouble. So I think this is another thing yet again aside from tech, aside from connectivity, aside from how we approach education, another element of how to handle such crisis moments because before this we were already struggling, we already had people losing their jobs and then this happens and we're hearing figures such as 300,000 people losing their jobs just in one sector or lack 
that is tourism. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a problem that I think moving forward, we need to figure out how we will be handling it because that is not something that we want to, you know, deal with. But also highlighted on the nation this morning, we have how the virus affects the human body, how it happens. Now, there's an outlining, very informative piece on page three of the... Um, Nation, where we're told, uh, for Professor Matthew Fireman told, uh, of the University of Maryland School of the Medicine of Medicine notes that the body may produce the immune cells, which end up damaging and killing even more healthy tissue. So while the body is trying to fight off coronavirus, it goes even against its, itself because it is going all out against uh, a foreign body. Then the stomach is also affected, liver damage, the kidney, the blood, and you know uh, there was this notion that young people cannot be affected by coronavirus but it is said by the medics that even when you recover you might not be the same because the body has been literally to war trying to protect you and to heal so this is a very interesting piece I think to bring forth understanding of how this a virus can actually affect you and how people actually succumb to it particularly those who are more vulnerable absolutely and uh, going back to the standard and moving away from COVID-19 for a bit. Mm. It's not all doom and gloom for all companies. One company that seems to be moving from height to height is Safaricom. Yeah. And the story on page four and five is the making of a 101 billion mm -hmm. cash cow. Yeah. And for the first time in many years, we have one of the things that people spend most on other than alcohol or coming number, number one before <laughs> alcohol is airtime. Yes. And this for obvious reasons. Of course, we've become a very social community. Mobile phones now are literally a uh, need rather than a want. And this gives a breakdown of how that money is being made. Mm -hmm. And mobile data caters for 40.7 billion. Yes. But again, this also tells us the times that we're in. Because, I mean, can you imagine we can't do what we're doing right now. We would not be able to work from home if yes. we're not able to have connectivity right. uh, through data. Mm -hmm. You have 84.4 billion on M-Pesa again. This is a model that Kenya has led in terms of how we exchange our money and uh, our social you know, um, you know, capital in terms of how we, we interact with others, particularly our relatives, uh, those um, you know, up country. 84.4 billion Kenyan shillings, literally, um, that uh, Safaricom transacts in form of M-Pesa. Mm -hmm. And on the next page as well, we're told full year earnings outperform projections and we're told what Safaricom profits can buy. Six million COVID-19 test kits uh, of the brand approved for home-based use which costs uh, 12,000 a unit. Then we have 144,000 ventilators with a basic unit costing 500,000. Then we have 96,000 standard six by uh, eight meter classrooms at an estimated uh, cost of uh, 700 um, uh, 750,000 shillings each and it goes further into details on what that cash could actually uh, procure. Then we have a ban on betting costs, Safaricom 1.9 billion, but I think right now they won't be feeling that pinch as much. And at, uh, at the same time, it's quite interesting right here that the, 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 the airtime be a bit beer as the top source of exercise, excise tax, but obviously this is because beer vendors are not faring on quite as well as they would have normally because we are self-isolating, we're told to work from home, businesses are switching to Zoom and other ways of communicating, while it's certain outlets and the vendors are not really free to sell as they would. And you know that is being trans, trans, you know, being, that is translating into the figures that we're seeing here financially speaking. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, there's also an article which I think is of interest, a feel-good article, I would call it. Yeah. And this is uh, called by the standard on page eight, Golden Hearts. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly looking at people who have gone out of their way to use the financial capital that they have mm -hmm. and influence to just help in COVID-19. We have MasterCard and Equity committing $1.1 billion. Uh, for personal protection equipment, PPE. Mm -hmm. We also have a member of parliament there, um, Swarup Arab Mishra, who yeah. uh, set aside 50 million 
to save locals from effects of the virus. And mm. Trix, I think what is clear yes. is right now we cannot rely and wait on government only mm -hmm. to sort us out because at the end of the day, this is huge, nobody expected it, and let's face it, we don't have a very accountable government. So we may need, uh, you know, corporates and uh, private uh, practitioners coming in just to help in where they can. Yeah, and those that uh, uh, rule that was passed that you have to go through government, I wonder how they're faring on, is it being followed largely, and how it is that that framework works when you want to give out to vulnerable people persons in the community how do you work with the local communities i wonder how successful that has been but uh, speaking of that um, and helping one another there are some people who in need of help in el geo marquet tolgos christ criticized uh, cr criticizes how residents are were evicted from the forest in 2019 now mudslide victims agree to resettled in embobut forest that is something i think that is might have a certain nuances but it is more on a positive note because they, after the, land, the mudslides they had nowhere to go and section of the forest which is part of the Cheringanyu water tower that covers 65 hectares will be ceded to settle these families. This is on page 22 of the standard and if you can see them they're pictured there all seated out in the field probably in the cold donning their masks as they all should but of course there's a, a lot of challenges that they're experiencing right now and the governor Alex Tolgos, Tolgos was addressing them the the residents in a way that I think also is admirable that despite their problems that they're facing they're all spaced out the one meter apart rule is being observed here and obviously hopefully this is something that comes to an end as far as their suffering goes Absolutely. Social mm. distancing is a new norm. Mm. And like they said, we may never go back to where we were before trick. Yeah. So it looks like this would be something we might as well get used to. Yeah. Uh, I, one wonders how political rallies are going to be carried out once yeah. we get to the other side of COVID-19. Because mm. that's one of the areas that people really gather. And I have a feeling, I yeah. don't know, um, I have a feeling that we sh might just go back to where we were before. If only uh, because of the, the, the at, political uh, rallies. Uh, well, political rallies, yeah. and uh, let's face it, as uh, Africans, we are very social, mm -hmm. and, you know, distance is something that we are not used to, social distancing, let yes. me call it, mm -hmm. uh, is something that we're not used to. So we probably are social distancing because of the constant reminder that we have and the fact that that's the new normal now. But I think with time, we are likely to go back to, I mean, think about it even in terms of weddings. Mm -hmm. um, when, when a bride is getting into the reception, we... The women get up together and yeah, sing, gather. and uh, if you think of uh, initiation processes, yes. uh, our culture is so built around being together. Mm -hmm. So chances are we might trigger back to where we were. For sure, for sure. And um, uh, yeah, but sorry, yeah, I was ahead. going to say let's look at matters education on page 12 on uh, the standard, yes. where <clears throat> yesterday we highlighted and we were looking at a story where. Parents were wondering whether they should pay fees, and mm. even with that fees, how much should it be? But out of that, we have school sued over online learning fees. Mm -hmm. uh, the picture that is put there is Brooke House, yes. and some parents have gone to court uh, suing the school for online tuition fees. Mm -hmm. And just to give you, uh, you know, some of the figures, we have uh, Little Brook Stage 1, they have an annual fees of 300,000 Kenyan shillings. Uh, you have uh, some fees going up to even 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. It's quite incredible, but then I wonder how they would justify this because there are some uh, schools that have actually reduced their fees for the online program so the kids can actually go on with their schooling, but at the same time, these fees are reduced. But then when it comes to this particular school, they're actually, sky the, the fees are, <laughs> are incredible. The figures that you see right here, and obviously you would understand why someone would feel aggrieved enough to sue the school for that because they're not getting the full physical you know experience that they would if they were attending school as usual and we are told here children are also getting online physical classes that include swimming although they are practically glued to their computers so I wonder how they're swimming through their screens it, it can be infuriating <laughs> I would imagine 
to a parent. Yeah, well, I, I guess in their defense, you know, um, one might argue and say it is a private school. Yeah, that's it. It is one that you enroll uh, on your own will, so mm. it's willing buyer, willing, willing seller. seller yeah. And as a result, you certainly yeah, would uh, enroll in that school knowing um, that this is the kind of fee structure they have. Yes. But of course, there are probably parents who are already taking their children to that school mm. and would find it difficult to move them. But there you go. That's yeah. a story that would be interesting to read. But below that, mm -hmm. we also have the ANC leader, and that is Musalia Mudavadi saying that calls need to be made to plan education amid corona. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a question, of course, of what plan does the Ministry of Education have for the children, particularly those who might be in rural areas who may not have internet connectivity, they may not have the advantage of having gadgets where they can continue with their education, yet we still are expecting that um, exams are going to be held as they normally are towards mm -hmm. the end of the year. So what plans is the Ministry of Education making to ensure that everybody is equal at, when it's time for exams? Absolutely, and also to the side right there, the whole page is all about education and we are told the number of schools that have shut in one year as is 6,500, more than those actually, and this is at primary school and uh, secondary school level, and another 1,655 public primary schools were closed down according to uh, the economic survey data released earlier on this week. Another important thing to note back to this um, story about the school sued over online uh, learning uh, fees. Generally private schools are suffering because uh, ra or rather private school teachers are suffering because most of them are not going to be paid their salaries because of these earnings that have gone down. So I feel like while this, some, some of these figures are quite interesting and to some might seem exorbitant, some of these private schools are hard pressed to keep charging these figures because of uh, the need to pay their, their schools. Those tutors that you see, uh, you know, having to painstakingly use Zoom to teach um, the classes, even if it's not swimming, <laughs> the other classes that are actually teachable via Zoom. So it is a whole, it's an industry problem and hopefully they can figure out a way forward that won't actually affect the students mm. in a very negative way. Absolutely. Yeah. And now we are, we are still on matters education. On page 10 of the Daily Nation, mm. there is a report that shows that enrollment of primary schools have dropped. Mm -hmm. And uh, the number of children enrolling primary schools dropped by 400,000. Um, it's not given us a clear indication of what period of time this yeah. 400,000 is, but mm. it's an indication of poor transition from early childhood development education centers, which basically just means that from the time children get into school on yes. early ch uh, child education to the point where now they transition to primary school and secondary school there's a huge gap mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason could it be as a result of um, you know having no school fees could it be that facilities in schools are not you know adequate right. um, to a point where they find that they're wasting their time so an interesting article there just highlighting that our education sector may be uh, suffering a huge blow and this is before even COVID-19 came in so yes, one yes. wonders what will happen post COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And speaking of COVID-19, and there are various tales in both the Daily Nation and the Standard this morning that tell, tells us from, of, of the perception of people who were in quarantine and who were released. And um, there's a story on page six uh, about uh, Joyce Wangeshi who said, I had a clean bill of health. I had nothing to worry about. My worry was how would my son react on seeing me? And she says she was happy to get out uh, of of quarantine and see her family but felt for those who were she was leaving behind in quarantine as we have heard several over and over again it's not easy to be isolated like that in quarantine in fear of whether you have this virus or not but um, if we're talking about the effects about society or what happens after look at page 10 of the standard we're told stigma on recovered patients as COVID-19 cases rise to 384 now now, as country continues to report more uh, you know, recoveries, gains are being re derailed by the refusal of families and communities to take patients back. I mean, that is so unfortunate, don't you think, Mike? Very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we've talked about the stigma that this brings. You can imagine uh, tricks, God forbid, but if you are in an isolation center or right. quarantine center, mm -hmm. when you're leaving, you have so many things that you're uncertain about. One of them being 
the community you're going to go into. Uh, they could be pointing fingers and saying, ule, unaona ule? Mm -hmm. Ule ni ule alikuwa na COVID. Exactly. So everybody obviously avoids, even from, yeah. even from the kiosk where you mm -hmm. buy your milk, mm -hmm. uh, or from the supermarket, the, you become labeled, yeah. which should not be the case. I know. But it, this, I guess, comes also as a result of uh, lack of information, and, and both, both because Ministry of Education, uh, of uh, Health, yeah. may not have given that education, but also the fact that COVID-19 is still strange to yes. all of us. So we yes. don't know what, you know, that means. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, some people actually, uh, you know, compare this uh, to the time when HIV AIDS was so stigmatized to the point that people would literally hound you out of communities because of that. And therefore, these are just some of those trends mm -hmm. that are still within society. And this was rather sudden. Even if we would talk about um, educating society about it. I think the initial priority for government was to actually protect the community and then some of these things I think now would right. come later in teaching people about it and how it is not something you need mm. to worry about after one has recovered. You know, one of the things I cannot wait to see post-COVID-19 is what Hollywood is going to do with COVID-19. Because <laughs> I can guarantee you going we're to going have to have, a have some very interesting movies. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, a few movies coming out there. I mean, we've had enough movies regarding the Holocaust and yes. uh, Armageddon mm -hmm. and all that. But I'm sure COVID-19 is definitely giving directors a lot of material to that they can with. give us uh, some entertainment on. Yeah. Uh, but another reason why I can't wait to watch them is because hopefully we'll be watching those movies and saying, remember COVID-19 yeah. and mm -hmm. how it took us all by storm. I'm sure, yeah, because nobody, some people have been even calling it the World War III. But it, it really is something that you would not forget, who, uh, especially those who come from areas that have been seen, for example, Italy in America, I'm sure this is going to be a, a mark in their history book, a very big deal. And obviously, Hollywood is going to go crazy. I think Hollywood, Bollywood, Nollywood, all of them are going to go crazy uh, with their own versions of events and how they interpret it artistically. But it's quite interesting to see Absolutely. that the num we some people have said that we are flattening the curve right now. We're not going as high. You took a, take a look at Tanzania, and their numbers just shot up. Maybe it's because of their increased testing, but it seems like we are discovering less numbers. It was one in Nairobi and nine at the coast. So it seems we're faring on well. I'm hoping this is not because that we haven't done comprehensive testing and perhaps we're just getting better at handling this um, uh, pandemic. Absolutely. Well, on to international news before we take a break. Uh, and Uganda is ready to relax lockdown restrictions. Mm. You also have 300 COVID-19 cases in Morocco prisons. So hopefully, this could be an indication that worldwide the virus is yeah. getting under control. Yeah. Let's hope that that's the case. Because remember, Wuhan, right now, I think the last report I read, they have no new cases of yes. COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely. It's looking up everywhere, even in the United States, where that is hardest hit. They are thinking of opening up. So hopefully, this is something we can put behind us, even before 2020 gets a halfway through. But I guess that is one of the elements that that are quite uh, positive about the news this morning. And for example, the country Uganda you have pointed out is doing quite well, some say, because they have faced Ebola before. So uh, uh, one, uh, a disease that was quite deadly and obviously they were much more better and better prepared to handle this pandemic. So hopefully another positive that comes out of it is that we will be able to handle other so for sorts of tragedy in the future. But I guess that brings us to the end of Press Review. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have Biko Zulu joining us, or rather Michael will be telling us how to creatively spend time at home from his living room. Stay tuned for that and much, much more.